Welcome to American Impressionism, Lure of the Artist Colony, an impressive exhibition of more than 100 works by some of the most important artists to embrace the style in the United States. This comprehensive gathering features, for the first time, one of the museum's greatest strengths, its own collection of works by American Impressionists. Lyrical landscapes, ranging from snow-covered hills to sun-filled harbors and seascapes, penetrating portraits, and remarkable still-life paintings document an important moment in the history of American art. It includes more than 100 total works, including more than 80 oil paintings and 30 works on paper dating from the golden age of American Impressionism, the 1880s through the 1940s. A wide range of early 20th century approaches to Impressionism, including an abiding interest in capturing the effects of light and atmosphere in loosely brushed compositions, is explored. The story of American Impressionism is told, at least in part, by the popular artist colonies that emerged at the end of the 19th century and served as destinations for painters from a variety of locations, beginning first in the northeastern part of the nation, not far from cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. From the east to the west coast, artists assembled together to escape the rigors of their city studios, share and exchange ideas through camaraderie, take on students, exhibit together, and to attract new clientele. Perhaps the biggest luxury that artist colonies afforded painters was the benefit of being able to focus, first and foremost, on his or her craft without interruption. Drawn from the city to these picturesque locales near the sea and harbors or nestled among rolling hills, scores of artists who gathered in colonies were able to explore painting out of doors, en plein air, which became a popular mode for artists beginning in the second quarter of the 19th century. Artists of the Barbizon School, which preceded French Impressionism, were among the first to regularly paint outdoors in the environment of the Forest of Fontainebleau, located about 30 miles outside of Paris. This new form of direct artistic observation became an instrumental element of Impressionism, an approach to painting that developed in the 1860s. The international popularity of plein air painting had by the late 1880s and 90s made its way to America from France. Painting outdoors suited Impressionism perfectly as the style enlisted fleeting moments in nature, changeable effects of light and atmosphere, and spontaneous compositions laden with thick layers of paint. Many of the artists included in this exhibition received some formal training in Europe, most frequently in France, where avant-garde movements in art had taken hold. The exhibition is arranged according to the artist colonies that played a critical role in the development of American Impressionism around the turn of the century. The colonies at Cos Cobb and Old Lyme in Connecticut, Cape Cod, Cape Ann, and Rockport in Massachusetts, New Hope in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, Taos, New Mexico, and California are examined. Within each of these colonies, artists were able to teach, collaborate, and escape the daily rigors of their city studios. Often located in scenic locations within striking distance of major cities, artist colonies served up steady doses of natural beauty and provided ample subject matter. In addition to the artist colonies, the exhibition also explores expatriate artists like John Singer Sargent and Mary Cassatt, artists who spent the majority of their careers in Europe, embracing the latest styles and movements and exhibiting with their colleagues abroad. Cassatt, for example, after studying at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, moved to Paris and was invited by Edgar Degas to exhibit with the French Impressionists in the 1870s and 80s. John Singer Sargent began his formal training in Rome in the late 1860s. His studies took him to Florence in the early 1870s and to Paris by the mid-1870s. By the turn of the century, he was the leading portrait artist on the continent and in great demand among the elite. New York Impressionism was anchored by William Merritt Chase, who became one of the most venerated figures in American art because of his painting skills and his remarkable abilities as a teacher. Described as the most important teacher of his generation, he was not committed to any one style of painting. Instead, he blended elements of various styles including realism, impressionism, and tonalism, reflecting his willingness to grow and change with an evolving art world. He taught for many years at New York State's Art Students League. Chase was a dedicated plein air painter who once claimed, I don't believe in making pencil sketches and then painting your landscape in your studio. You must be right under the sky. 
The artist conducted many summer workshops throughout the East Coast and in Europe, with the best known being his school at Shinnecock, an area of beaches and dunes on the eastern end of Long Island. In addition to giving classes in oil and pastel painting, Chase completed numerous plein air landscapes of the area. The popular school lasted for 12 seasons beginning 1891. An important artist colony formed in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, nestled along the Delaware in the village of New Hope, within striking distance of Philadelphia, where annual exhibits were held at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Artist William Langston Lathrop and his family arrived in New Hope, Bucks County, Pennsylvania in 1898, renting a property at Phillips Mill. The following year, they purchased a miller's house and surrounding farm. A number of fellow artists, including Henry Snell and Charles Rosen, and the students began to pay visits to the Lathrops. The Lathrop residence became the heart of the New Hope Artist Colony. Annie Lathrop served afternoon tea each Sunday during the summer to friends and family. The natural beauty of the property with its limestone walls, rolling lawn, and view of the Delaware filtered through a screen of trees provided constant subject matter for Lathrop, his friends, and pupils. Edward Willis Redfield's arrival in New Hope in 1898 coincided with Lathrop's and firmly established the colony as an attraction for artists and students. Redfield, who was known for his pioneering spirit and rugged approach to painting outdoors, came into possession of a large island farm and a few acres along the Delaware Canal, just north of New Hope, not far from Phillips Mill. A third major artist, Daniel Garber, renowned painting teacher at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, arrived in New Hope in 1907. Garber settled north of the hamlet on Cutalosa Farm with nearby creek, view of the Delaware, and its quarries. The New Hope art colony continued to thrive well into the 1920s. Redfield may have described the colony's appeal best when he said, Bucks County was a place where an independent, self-sufficient man could make a living from the land, bring up a family, and still have the freedom to paint as he saw fit. Artists also began to flock to Greenwich, of which Koskob is a part, during the last decades of the 19th century. Koskob, located in southern Connecticut, just off Long Island Sound, was easily accessible from New York City by a short train ride, possessed a picturesque harbor and shipyard, charming clapboard architecture, and nearby small farms. In the 1870s, the Holly family had opened a boarding house to accommodate the growing numbers of artists and tourists who sought rest and relaxation in this suburban enclave. The Holly House became the nucleus of the art colony and provided necessary ambience for artists, poets, journalists, and political commentators to exchange ideas and experiment. J. Alden Weir and John Henry Twachtman were among the earliest artists to arrive and stay at Holly House in the late 1870s. Twachtman settled in Greenwich in 1889 and began teaching summer classes with Weir for the Art Students League based in New York. The colony flourished until the 1920s and saw the transition of Greenwich from a working class fishing and farming village to an upscale suburb of New York City. Other important artists associated with the colony included Ernest Lawson, Leonard Ochtman, Emil Carlson, and Robert Reed. By the 1890s, artists began exploring the eastern coast of Connecticut and gathered in Old Lyme. The quiet town was a retreat where artists could easily escape the city. Henry Ward Ranger was among the first artists to recognize the scenic beauty of the area, ideally suited to painting en plein air or out of doors. The artist was seeking a town that could create an American Barbizon, based on the mid-19th century French colony formed just outside of Paris. Ranger wrote to his agent in New York, I want to drive you around and see a little of this beautiful country, where pictures are made, your station is Lyme. Much like Holly House in Cos Cobb, the nucleus of the colony at Old Lyme was Florence Griswold's boarding house. Griswold, the unmarried daughter of a prominent ship captain, made her property accommodating to artists and played hostess to lively conversations in the dining room and, during summer, on the side porch. She converted barns into studio space and transformed the front hall into an informal gallery for the display of paintings created by her tenants. 
Over the decades that the colony thrived, more than 200 artists including Child Hassam, Willard Metcalf, Clark Voorhees, Guy Wiggins, Chauncey Ryder, among others, participated in the communal experience of Old Lyme. Summer classes drew many artists to the colony, and by 1902, annual exhibitions mounted at the Noyes Library became the first American summer art show. Massachusetts, too, was home to rich art colonies at Rockport, Cape Ann, and Provincetown, where Charles Webster Hawthorne founded a summer school of painting known as the Cape Cod School of Art in 1899. Hawthorne had previously studied with William Merritt Chase on Long Island. Hawthorne was quickly followed by other artists who were attracted to the region because of its quaintness, natural beauty, and proximity to Boston. Picturesque harbor views, ocean vistas, and street scenes of historic buildings and charming neighborhoods attracted tourists and painters alike. The art colony at Ogunquit on Maine's southern rocky coast, much like Old Lyme in Connecticut, was formed in a quiet town that possessed enticing natural features, dramatic rock formations, stunning views of the sea from picturesque points, and charming historical structures, all of which were certain to attract artists. The interest in Ogonquit as an artist colony began when Boston painter Charles Woodbury visited for the first time in 1888. He purchased land at Perkins Cove in 1896 and built a studio there the following year. By 1898, he had opened the Ogonquit Summer School of Painting and Drawing and took on scores of students, including many women, mostly from the privileged class, seeking a pastime to explore creativity, social interaction, and fresh air. Between 60 to 100 students enrolled in the classes annually and could be spotted throughout town and the coastline painting on plein air. Woodbury believed in the importance of first-hand observation of nature and drew inspiration from the Barbizon painters of France, remarking, I might say all my knowledge has been gained in the open air. Woodbury School thrived into the second decade of the 20th century and was followed by the other teachers including modernist Hamilton Easter Field, who established his own school at Ogonquit in 1911. The Field School played an important role in guiding a generation of avant-garde artists such as John Marin, Martin Hartley, and Marguerite and William Zorak. By the last years of the 19th century, art colonies and summer schools for painters also formed in the western United States, including Taos, New Mexico, and Laguna, California. The stunning natural beauty, agreeable climate, and the rich culture of the Taos Pueblo were all attractions. In California, the artist Colin Campbell Cooper was drawn to Santa Barbara with its lush gardens, major resort hotels, and spectacular views. Laguna Beach held similar appeal and was home to an established art colony by around 1900. From coast to coast, America's rich artist colonies continued to draw well-known artists and teachers, as well as students and those seeking instruction during the summer months. By the 1920s, strains of European modernism began to enter the American art scene, and painting outdoors in these charming, picturesque locales began to experience a decline. The enduring legacy, however, of these rich artistic communities continues to enrich the history of American art and help to tell the multifaceted story of Impressionism in the United States.